morning. I haven't got a cup of coffee. I haven't even got a drink of orange. I've run out of oranges. <laughs> so I've got to go out at some point and go and get some more. Oh, it's been a hell of a, just almost three weeks now. And although I could, I'm kind of like, I've got enough energy to get out and go and do stuff, I reckon, but I just feel so lazy now. I spent a whole week in bed over Christmas, New Year, feeling I was gonna die. <laughs> and I really didn't care. <laughs> just thought, doesn't matter, does it? And I kept thinking about this body that I'm in and how grateful I am for it and what it's done for me over the years and how do I operate it and all the deep thoughts that go in to, you know, thinking when you're <laughs> bored, I guess. You've got nothing to think about, but Oh, I've also been trying to read a book, but my eyes hurt so much I just couldn't get into anything. Anything I could really do is put a film on either Netflix or Sky and just, you know, listen to that. Uh, it's nice to have it on in the background because it made me feel as though I had some company. <laughs> I found a picture of my, um, well, a cabin in the woods and it's beautiful. It's not like the cabin that I hire though. Uh, <laughs> it looks like a, one that you can live in. The one that I have you can't live in. Yeah, It's got no shower or bathroom for a start, no loo. <laughs> Or um, proper heating, really. It's only got that wood burner, which doesn't heat the whole place up. Just all the holes in the wall <laughs> make it all the heat disappear very rapidly. Uh, we are told by weather forecasters that we're going to have a lot of snow soon, but I, I can't see it happening somehow. I feel as if I need a, a shower or a nice hot bath. Just get rid of all the gunk that's on me and in me. It's horrible. I've had a good detox anyway. So, <laughs> at the moment, I think I can count on one hand the meals I've had in the past two and a bit weeks. Two bubbles of soup. Eggs. I seem to be relying on eggs an awful lot. Vitamin D, I guess. Yeah, I'm missing vitamin D. I haven't been out. I haven't been out for a walk. I've been out twice in my car to go and get necessities. Um, I'm in a place where I've got nobody really around me. So I'm I'm okay. My voice is coming back, my nose is clearing up and the cough is going away, so it's good. But the thing is I've been thinking about over the past few weeks. You know, I can consider myself a lucky woman. I've got my faculties about me, contrasting with what people think. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care what they think. Well, I do really. It puts a stab in your heart, doesn't it, when people say horrible things about you. And then you look at it and you think, well, why should I bother? I don't know these people. I've not got any influence over my life. And whatever they say, I'm not going to obey, am I? <laughs> Talking about obeying. Oh dear. I've been looking at all the different psychological experiments that have been happening over the past 60 years, maybe 100 years. I was also thinking about Christmas as well. New Year, and while everybody was happy and, well, pretending to be happy half the time, I think. And I was lying here in my bed, thinking about people being happy, parties and things. Mm. One thing I really didn't want to go to is parties. So I got out of them really quite neatly, didn't I? 
I was spared all of that. You know, bustling about baubles on the trees and panicking about presents and <laughs> things like that. And then he, you know, fighting over the goggle box in the corner of the room. <laughs> Who's going to watch what? Oh no, I want to watch this. No, I've got, I've got to watch the end of this. <laughs> Uh, one thing I ha I am going to miss for a while is um, yeah the Gilded Age. It's good. I like those fictionalised facts about a period in history, and they bring it alive and make it seem so real. And you look about, look at those people living in those times, and I think they're all in graves now being dug up by churches and being sold off, the land's being sold off, so where are their bodies going? So really, isn't it? The only people who get to stay on this earth are kings and queens and dignitaries. Have their bodies put in abbeys and cathedrals and castles. It does seem weird though. I look at this body and I think, I. What animates it? I don't tell it to wiggle my fingers. It just does it. <laughs> One thing with being ill is my nails have grown really long and I can't type with them now and I haven't got any scissors here. I have to go and get some somewhere. But yeah, it's sad, isn't it, really? I think of all those people in um, Downton Abbey. They're all. You know, those pe people that lived during that time and all the things they worried about and all the things they did, said and interacted with other people and all the activities they got involved in, it's all gone now. It's dust. And them too. All their emotions, all their thoughts, all their creativity, all their sufferings, all their pain. And the happiness is too. Gone. Just like that. And that'll be us soon too. Why am I being so morose? I was morose over this period of time. I was just getting deep into the thoughts of life, death and the universe. <laughs> and what's it all about? Yeah, no, when I, when I look at the past, and I, I, I see Christmases throughout the ages and all the Christmases and New Year's that I've had. I never see hatred. I never see envy. I never see like people being unkind to one another. And yet all the films that I try to watch over the new, you know, that period of time when I couldn't get out, what about people shooting each other and ending each other's lives and being nasty to one another? It just seems really as so though we're being pro programmed to think in a certain way that humanity is horrible. Well, it isn't. You know, we've just got to stop fearing each other. Okay, let's think about it over the past few years. We've all been in told to fear something or other, aren't we? There's always been a war of some kind, somewhere. And those your Ukrainian men that are fleeing their country in order to not be drafted into those front lines of slaughter, I don't blame them. You know, when the First World War, people didn't want to go to war or couldn't go to war, they were given white feathers to Show that they were cowards. They weren't cowards. They were sensible. They were the people with their heads screwed on. Why? War is so... Oh, it's idiotic. It really is idiotic. I think I've spoken about this before, but... Why should one man put his body in a trench or on a front line to be shot at or bombed or gassed or whatever else, the horrors they can think of just because one man wants more land or more money 
and he thinks of an excuse so that it fires up the passion inside that man to be patriotic and honourable to go and get himself killed. And, it, and you think about Ukraine keep going chasing after all these men, taking them off the streets. One guy went to the barbers and got grabbed by the bloody army. Okay, so if you get to the point where you're starting to have to grab people off the streets in order to put them on the front lines, you must be losing. So take a hint and stop it. I don't know the ins and outs of all these wars and who causes them or what they're for, but I seem to think along the line somewhere that the Ukrainians of that part that Russia came into were inviting the Russians in. But who am I? And all these countries of the world, they're all corrupt. It's got to stop, isn't it? Somehow. Something's got to stop. Something's got to change. What is going on in the world? I keep looking back on the history books and thinking, this doesn't ring true to me. And how can you have a dark ages in a medieval period where people had writing, people had pens, people had paper. They could write things down. They weren't all dumb. They created clothes and things to operate their lives for, with. Created farming equipment to grow food. There is something deeper, there is something more mysterious going on. And people who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it all the time. And I think that's why it's hidden from us. We're taught to conform, we're taught to obey, we're taught to just forget ourselves and think of the greater good. Oh God, I'm depressed. <laughs> Must be. I keep thinking about these. Wars don't make sense. They're kind of um, a way to get population reduced, aren't they? That's all it is. And why, if you've got such a downer on men, do you want them to go and fight you for your country? I feel sorry for them. I do. I watched this film recently. It was odd, weird, I just couldn't understand it. And I didn't like it. Called Faux. Go and watch it and see how we really think about it. Because <laughs> it's crazy. It's about this. Three people in the film. And then a load of like non-player characters. Background extras type of thing. They're all based in this one farmhouse. In the middle of nowhere in America. And uh, in the future, it's talking about this man had the opportunity to go and live on a space station, but the woman had to stay behind. And so that she didn't feel so lonely, they would replace her husband with a robot, an android, who looked just like him. And as the film went on, they kind of like twisted the mind of this man, made him feel he was strong to start with. He's a lovely human being. Good. No, good man. They loved each other. Although the film says that they don't love each other. But and then it went throughout the film saying torturing his mind and his body. And then it ended up weird. Shall I tell you the end? Do you want to know the end? If you don't want to know the end, then blot out from this bit until I tell you. <laughs> Just go fast forward. Um, it turned out that the man that she was crying over and he was crying over her was the android. And the man who was, who'd already gone to the space station and come back for some reason, I thought I couldn't make out. Why didn't he stay up there? Why didn't the android stay? Because I think that was another population reduction thing. It was getting rid of men. And the man who replaced this man who had been tortured and mentally and 
physically abused was the real human being and at the end it was being wrapped up in a plastic bag like he was the android. It was horrible. So he didn't get to go to the space station, did he? Because <laughs> he would have stayed there. He wouldn't have gone back. Is that, is that like a predictive programming? Is that what they want? Instead of sending men off to wars, they're going to do that to them. And the women, I guess, as well. Yeah, I do wonder what's happening in the world. I think it's not warm enough in this van. When it gets to minus one, <laughs> I'm fucked. <laughs> I've got this heater on, but it's not really warming the place up. Guess I'll have to take the walls down to see what the padding is behind it. I don't want to do that, but I know it's going to have to be done at some point. Maybe then I can change the things around in this van. Yeah, yeah I've been thinking about that too. <laughs> and over the years, throughout my working lifetime, I've had loads of opportunities to get insights into things. Not like in-depth knowledge, I don't know everything, obviously. In fact, I'm quite stupid sometimes. But I think of the variety of information that I've been able to gather over the years. It's come from, what, media, marketing, the military and psychology. They're quite good things to become aware of, aren't they? And I've read loads and loads of books. And when I was into marketing, I read this book by Edward Bernays called Propaganda. And it just showed you how he twisted the minds of the American population through adverts, advertising. They even convinced doctors to say that smoking was great for you. <laughs> and then he got the suffragettes involved to try and get the women to smoke. Apparently lined them all up and made them stand like the Statue of Liberty and their cigarettes were the whatever like is she's holding in her hand flame of freedom or something, I don't know what it is. That got women smoking. And now look, they're saying it's against the law. Well, can I soon. Why is it against the law when at one point you're encouraging us to do it? Like loads of things. Encouraging us to buy diesel vans and cars because you could go loads of miles on a diesel. Now they're telling us not to happen. Fucked up world. Fucked up politicians. They convince you to do things and then they tell you not to do them. It's like they're dealing with kids. It's gaslighting, isn't it? Have you ever watched that film called Gaslighting? Where this woman was slowly driven mad by her husband because he kept turning down the gas lamps and blaming her for it. And she thought, no, I haven't done that. I think in the end she killed him. <laughs> but again, murder, killing, ending life, again. Oh. But yeah, we've all been taught to think of, you know, put feelings first before facts. Even the kids today, they can't even ever give an argument, can they? Can't sit there and think, okay, somebody disagrees with me, let's see what they have to say. They just cry when they get somebody who's saying, okay, you call me a misogynist, what is that? What is a misogynist in your eyes? <laughs> this girl just cried and walked away. Why don't you just say? <laughs> you've got to use a word, you've got to know what it means. Feelings, not facts, eh? All the adverts, the films, TV programmes, all the documentaries, they're all designed to get your emotions engaged. Your ego. Eh? For years they've been telling us, trust the science. 
And then you get somebody like Anthony Fauci come along. I'm a scientist. I trust the science. Fuck off. I guess someone like me would be taken off to a re-education camp. And they're not pleasant places. Re-education? I don't mind being educated and then paying for me to be educated. I love education. I love learning stuff. Those types of education camps are not pleasant. And they do exist. And they're going to exist for this country too, I gather. Apparently there's one in Leicester. I mean, it takes people, ordinary people, to put the fencing up, put the alarm systems in, dig the holes to, you know, <laughs> put... Oh. Ordinary people, men in general, in their own prisons. Oh, <sighs> you think about gaslighting, it's just one person repeating their truth, their own truth, over and over and over and over again to another person who doesn't believe it to start with and thinks, in the end, start doubting themselves and then they think they're mad. That's basically what gaslighting is. You know, person one makes person two doubt their own memory or their confidence. It kind of like erodes the confidence. That's what it does. Have you ever heard of Biderman's chart of coercion? Amnesty International used it in 1973 to talk about their, you know, report on torture. The read technique, <coughs> REID. You might know of it as good cop, bad cop, but that's been stopped now because they always get false confessions under that kind of experiment. I mean, I know I had to study loads of research reports when I was doing my MA, and I know you know academia is not the be all and end all. They make you focus down on one subject to the detriment of everything else, and they pull. They make you pull in other research reports that validate what you're saying. They can't, unless you're doing a PhD, I guess. It's that, and that's new research. That's new findings, new avenues, and I'd love to be able to do that. I've got some ideas, but ain't got the cash at the moment. Maybe I'll do it in my seventies. <laughs> And the Ash Conformity Experiment, 1950s, 51 I think it was. Uh, they got people to, like a group of people went into a room, looked at a load of pictures of lines on a page. One was visibly smaller and there was one person who wasn't in on the gag type thing. And they were all saying, that one's the shortest, and it was the longest. <laughs> Everybody was saying, yeah, that's the shortest. Not exactly that, but... And the one who was not in on the game looked at it and thought, am I, am I odd? Am I crazy? <laughs> and just agreed with them so that they wouldn't feel as though they were out of it, you know, not part of the group, so to speak. And there was a Stanley Milgram, my birth year actually, 1963. I'm sure everybody knows about that one. Where people were brought into a room and told that if this person answers a question wrong, then press that button and let it recruit them. And the screams were getting louder and louder and louder, and they were still doing it. <laughs> then the Fessinger. Festinger. He had two groups of people. One was paid one pound or one dollar, and one was paid twenty dollar dollars for this experiment. They had to go into a room and turn a knob around in a hole, and they thought it was like to do with motor development, that sort of thing, cognitive motor. <laughs> 
and they were doing this really dull task for hours on end and they had to come out of the room and tell the person who was going to go into the room and say how exciting it was, how really good it was. The people who are paid the most agreed to the value of their lives. Then there was this other experiment done by a non-scientist, non-psychologist, non-psychiatrist. We coined the term learned helplessness. It's cruel. It was a really cruel experiment. I put dogs in a cage and randomly they would just press a button and electrocute them. First of all, they started to try to escape from the cage and they couldn't. And eventually they just gave up. And then when they opened the cage door, and they electrocuted the dogs. They didn't even try to get out. Oh, that's cruel, isn't it? Why? Why would you do that? Why would you even think about doing that? And I suppose you've all heard of Kinsey, Alfred Kinsey. He did loads of experiments and research things with sex. Did you know that he uh, joined forces with uh, Planned Parenthood? It's students of his that are now encouraging the kids of today to question their gender. Teachers openly admit it. So, you know, if they put a black mark on me for talking about this, then... And all four adults, you know, making their own decisions on things. They can do what they want with their bodies, but kids... Don't confuse them. I know why they're doing it depopulation again. They change their gender and they can never have a child again. Never. They'll go through puberty even more confused and half of them commit suicide anyway. There's a load of them now coming out and saying this is wrong. The ones who have changed their gender have tried to change back. Do you know where Kinsey got all his subjects from? all his students from, his research test subjects, prison, violent sex offenders, and one of them was a known paedophile and he's still covering them up today. You know, when I did my masters, it was based on gender and I was just got it through in time. <laughs> God, thank you. See, I'm lucky, aren't I? It's when I finished it and succeeded in getting my MA that People started to tell me it was wrong that I'd done what Professor Kirsch had said, you know, cherry-picked the numbers and falsified the data. I can tell you why I didn't. I had two groups, two very obvious groups of people and some outliers. Uh, and they were all voluntary and I didn't experiment onto them to the degree where I tortured them <laughs> or made them think different ways. I just gave them pictures and asked them and little sentences and see what they agreed with and what they disagreed with. And it showed me that, you know, men need a certain, well they have, they adhere to a certain role in life and values and women apply their minds to other sets of values and roles in life. And, and that's not even going into the biology of the bodies. It's turned out to be a bit of a morose subject, isn't it, this video? Oh, I don't know. I, th I just think it's because I've been looking at history and doubting everything I've learned. I've got loads of history books, beautiful books. I used to get the Folio Society. Oh, gorgeous. Lovely books. I used to love opening them, smelling them, turning the pages and looking at the, the beautiful typeface and the writing and the pictures. And it's lovely. I've got loads of books on myths and legends and all these... Well, they're not myths and legends, are they? They're stories from history. They're real stories. <laughs> People never used to worship gods. I'll go into that very briefly. You imagine it, even like um, in the Second World War, it's been proven, this thing. 
if an advanced race of humans interacted with a lesser advanced race of humans and they had more technology more education able to grow stuff and you know do do various things um, that this other civilization wasn't able to then the less advanced civilization would think wow they would be so impressed they would think they were gods and you may have heard of the cargo cults in the Second World War. What happened then was that the Americans used this island from which to transport all their goods to the American army. Um, and they were coming in on planes and using all this technology that the islanders didn't know anything about. And they thought they were gods and they're, they're there today. They look at people, and anybody who comes along, they think they're gods. So I think all these gods of old are not gods. They're human beings. They were just more advanced. I mean, you've even got civilizations now, today, in the Amazon that haven't got what? person in New York is, has got. I think I'd prefer to live in the Amazon. And it would go back to all those experiments. They're just a few that you focus on that bring about the alarmist <laughs> attitude within you and you're going to think. You know, they're all designed to either make you conform, doubt your own thoughts. It's a type of gaslighting. And that's the danger in beginning to believe or trust the science because the science isn't always right I mean, I've looked at all of these different things and I think why do people fall for it I mean I, I would be the outlier I would be saying in that experiment with the lines I would be saying are you all mad that's the shortest line <laughs> that's what I'd be saying I used to say that in school and the teachers used to tell me off for it <laughs> I remember once sing, sitting in my RE class and nobody liked RE, religious education that is. The grey man, a bit like John Major. <laughs> and, and he couldn't handle a class. <laughs> Everybody used to shout and scream and throw things at each other and you know, typical thing that you see in the movies. They did that. And I used to sit there and think, I just want to learn something. Once, I got so irritated with it all, I stood up and I said, will you shut the fuck up? I'm trying to learn something here. <laughs> and they all sat down and were quiet. <laughs> oh dear. That's all it needed. <laughs> I don't really think of children of today. What chance have they got? If the, if the teachers are openly saying that they know what's going on, that they are deliberately confusing them with regards to their gender, and reading them pornographic books with cartoon characters in them that are showing everything and doing things to each other that are not meant for that age group, it's not their fault, is it? But they're turning out the way they are. Maybe instead of, you no, know, asking them a direct question, be kind to them and say, look, I know you come from a different educational background to what I do, and I, I understand completely. I'm going to ask you a question that might seem a bit <laughs> harsh, but I just want you to tell me what you know about this word. That's all. I'm not attacking you, I'm just, you know, if you don't know it and you feel awful talking to me about it, then say that, and I won't go any further. But, but then you kind of think, when I was a kid, <laughs> my dad and mum never used to do that to us. If I didn't know something, I used to say, why? Why? Why is that? Why did they do that? Why did they say that? Why does that happen? Why is the sky like that? 
why is there nothing in the universe? Why are the stars so far away? <laughs> I used to ask the question all the time. My dad used to say, shut up, twice. And the third time he said, next time I'm going to slap your legs. And he did. <laughs> so I got two warnings. And then a warning to tell me it was going to do the next. <laughs> if I did that. That stopped me asking questions. Only for a little while though. I used to ask somebody else then. And when I was at school I used to sit in the library all the time. Most people used to go out and be rabbit monitors. <laughs> look after the rabbits in the pen. I like doing that occasionally, but I loved the library best. Mrs Chamberlain, I doubt very much if she's still alive, but she had a green Morris Minor and I always wanted to be like her. I'm left with another question though. How do we change all this? It can't be a simple fact of changing your mind. It's like, oh, We've been taught not to trust our gut. We've been taught not to trust our instincts. To believe anything anybody says. Okay, but if you kind of like go into yourself and think, okay, maybe the gaslighting film where the woman was being accused of turning again the gas lamps when she wasn't. It was the husband, slowly turning them around. If she had just turned around to him and said, no, I haven't been turning them down. It must be you or one of the maids. If she had just done that, or stayed in the room all the time until she'd found the culprit. <laughs> or even just trusted herself and thought, okay, if that isn't true, then let me find out about it. Let me ask more questions. It's like, your gut tells you whether it's wrong or right. Your gut kind of like has this ability to swirl around. It's like a little toothpick, I guess, and punched into your tummy and going, yeah, wiggling around in your tummy. And then your heart shivers very, very slightly for a, a fraction of a second. So that, that's your instinct. That's your instinct telling you something's not quite right. Perhaps I should question it. And ask yourself, am I acting from my ego and my feelings my emotions, am I feeling embarrassed because I don't want to look small or stupid? But don't care about that, don't, don't. If somebody looks at you with a quizzical look when you've asked them, what do you mean? And they say, don't you know about that? You look at them straight faced and you say, no, I don't. In my whole of my lifetime, Whatever avenue I've pursued or learned or seen or experienced, I've never come across that before. So tell me about it. A good person will explain. An egotistical person who wants to put you down, who wants to make you feel small, will just continue to not tell you, will make you feel as though you are stupid. Because they don't know themselves. Ego is good when it protects you, you know, teaching you to run away or fight this, whatever. <laughs> it's not good if it takes over your heart. You close down your heart, you'll have no morals, no goodness inside you, no empathy for somebody else's suffering, confusion, questions. I don't know. That's what I've been thinking over Christmas and New Year. I, uh, been rattling around in my brain. <laughs> These atoms, molecules. I'm over this now, mostly. And thank goodness. <laughs> I'm not saying thank God. 
there is a God, but it's not a person God in the shape of a human being. It's, I don't know, magical essence that's inside all of us. Inside even, you know, this thing, this, this, this. It's in everything, everywhere. What do they say? Omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. <laughs> I just remember the Joey scene <laughs> in Friends. I'm not omnipotent, <laughs> omnipotent. <laughs> I'm not potent. That's what he thought. Shame about Chandler. He was the best one. I felt so sad when he died. October, the same month as my mum died, two years ago. Oh, I've got to get out of this slump. Past two years I've made progress. I've just got to get up and speed it up a bit more. But I have in my mind that apparently I've heard somewhere down the line that um, this world is going to end in 2028 and it's going to get worse from this year onwards and I think maybe those asteroids are going to come down again yeah in I think it is uh, about 12,000 years ago the asteroids came down you can see it on Google Maps if you look at the Earth and you look at it in a photographic point of view, you can see the shape where asteroids have hit this planet, and scraped along. Look at the bottom of South Africa. And when I think about, you go from the Middle East all the way across the Northern Africa and then across the middle of America, it's all sand. It's as though it's been scorched. I don't think that's the sun of today. I think that's like either nuclear fallout from years ago. And you look just east of Damascus, there's this massive black hole. Goodness knows what that was. So yeah, my theory is that these people got so advanced, so technologically and emotionally advanced and spiritually advanced that they knew how to connect with everything. They went over to these other lands where these people were not so far advanced, plucked a person out, brought him back, showed him Eden, <laughs> the Garden of Eden, which was their place, Atlantis maybe, the Eye of Africa. And then because he disobeyed them, ate the fruit from the tree. They put him back into old civilization. And when they put him back in old civilization, he started teaching people how to do what they were doing. Okay, so when the asteroids came down, pulverized most of the planet, unfroze the ice caps, flooded the whole earth. And then uh, if you were a survivor and you had uh, technology, but you, wanted it for yourself rather than from the community which is what the peaceful community was before then um, you would start ruling people nastily through fear wouldn't you that's what they've done and I think that's what the elitists have done they're not the elite elite is a good thing elite is perfection but elitists they're to be scoffed at because they look down on people. Not necessarily because they're better, but because they think they're better. And I guess they are better in a way because they're in control. <laughs> and we just let them control us through all these experiments that they do on us. And I think that's how history has gone. They've just hidden all of that his prehistory from us so that we don't get any ideas. Keep a population in fear, keep the population down. 
and then you know you can continue to rule can't you and now they're getting robots on the scene oh my goodness they're really going to be in control aren't they we've got to start thinking do you want to carry on living in a world like this nobody's going to come and save you the Atlanteans are not going to come back down from where they are the Pleiades they're not coming back we have to do it ourselves it's a shame isn't it why can't we all just live in harmony they can have their millions if they want it they can have all their stuff if they want it just leave us alone let's get on with it you've got your robots go and pick a continent and go and live on that and dig your bunkers and live the way you want to live with your robots and just leave us alone <laughs> oh, but they don't want to, do they? They want to be horrible. They get pleasure in pain. Oh, those poor kids. Anyway, I'm just getting morose again. I'm going to go. I'm sorry I haven't been posting for a while, but I just... I've been doing loads of other things. Yeah, getting courses ready and presentations and learning new stuff and so that I can help people. Yeah, I'd love to do a PhD just to suck it to them. <laughs> yeah, they won't let me do it for that reason. I've got to conform. <laughs> Yeah, if you want to do anything with any success in this world, you've got to conform to the norm. <laughs> uh. Anyway, I'll say goodbye for now, and I'll catch you another time. Yeah, tell me what you've been doing with your Christmas and New Year. I hope you had a happy one. Bye for now.